security and political affairs analyst and is joining us from Beirut. Ali, thanks very much for your time on Al Jazeera. What's very clear at this point is that Hezbollah has exposed. How much can it actually sustain? Well, I think that Hezbollah is responding today. What you're seeing today, the barrage of rockets, which your correspondent mentioned, I think that's part of the response. You have to remember that one of the declared goals of this new phase of escalation, as the Israelis announced themselves, is to safely return the inhabitants of northern Israel. I think that the uh, increased intensity and rocket fire, which we saw today, I think that's part of the response by Hezbollah translating its leader, Sayyid Hassan Nasrullah's words, which he stated that you won't be able to return uh, these, uh, these inhabitants by force. So we're seeing part of the Hezbollah retaliation now regarding the Israeli goals, thwarting the goals. Now, as to your question about how much can Hezbollah sustain, uh, indeed, Hezbollah is facing something unique. I don't think it's ever faced something like this before. The page of detonation was something the world hasn't even witnessed before. And Israel has shown that it's capable of targeting or striking high-value targets, uh, something which we, we haven't seen previously. Now, has, now Israel has assassinated uh, leading Hezbollah figures previously, like in 2008, Ahmad and in other cases. But what we saw yesterday and what we saw before I think takes it to a whole new level, particularly bearing in mind that uh, contrary to previous occasions, Hezbollah is in the midst of a conflict. So it supposedly it has to have or it should have all the precautionary measures in place. Regardless of that, Israel did succeed. So Hezbollah does face this challenge security wise, intelligence wise. And it remains to be seen how it's going to deal with that particular situation. I think it can still preserve some kind of structure. You know, it's a decentralized movement. It can still, I think, survive. But I think these painful blows do indeed inflict damage. And they do require Hezbollah to issue a retaliation which is somewhat dramatically different than the actions it has taken thus far in order to further deter Israel from committing more such acts. But at the same time, I do not expect that Hezbollah will carry out the kind of action which could be taken advantage of by Ali, the Israeli you, side. You People did touch yeah. on the issue of security. And we know that within Beirut, for instance, people are being restricted from going to sensitive areas. Clearly, it's a priority for Hezbollah to deal with the, the fear of infiltration and perhaps also deal with operational issues. And you've also mentioned how they are having to retaliate um, uh, to those strikes from Israel. So th there is a lot going on for the organization. There is. And as I said, uh, I, I don't think Hezbollah has ever faced such uh, monumental challenges before. Uh, Israel, it's clear that um, yeah, Hezbollah is facing weaponry it never faced before. The drones have been very damaging. The, as I said, the pages, this is something which no one in the world, I think, has faced, not just Hezbollah. So there are a lot of um, issues Hezbollah does have to deal with. We're seeing the initial response uh, right now, as I said, the rocket attacks. We don't know. This is an important point. We don't know what kind of cyber capabilities Hezbollah does possess? Can it respond possibly in kind to the Israeli side? I think it's safe to say that when it comes to technology, when it comes to you know communication, infiltration, these types of capabilities, it is safe to say that Israel does enjoy the upper hand. And I think, in fact, that's why Israel is pursuing this option, possibly as an alternative to a full-scale war. Because as we all know, in a full-scale war, uh, everyone's been warning about the damage which Hezbollah can do to Israel's home front, given its missile arsenal. So this by, might be the preferred method by Israel, given that it perceives that this will give it an upper hand. I think the real question is, how much of a difference will it make on the ground in terms of the situation on the Lebanese-Israeli front? Will it allow Israel to achieve its declared goals. Again, I have to emphasize, what were the Israeli goals? The Israeli right. goal behind this new phase of escalation is to safely return the inhabitants of northern Israel. These operations, I'm not sure if they're going to go that far in allowing Israel to achieve these goals. Yes, they do make for show. They do allow Netanyahu to further 
promote himself as being Mr. Security, show him making security achievements. But on the ground, I'm not sure how much of a difference that's going to make. And Hezbollah, whilst it has suffered casualties, it will always possess this capability to continue with these missile attacks. All right, Ali Rizik, thanks very much for your insights. Ali Rizik is a security and political affairs analyst. Thanks again for joining Al Jazeera. Let's move on to Gideon Leva. He is a columnist with Israeli newspaper Haaretz. He's joining us from Tel Aviv. Uh, Gideon, thank you very much for joining us on Al Jazeera. What is the end game for Israel? And specifically, specifically, excuse me, with regard to the support that Israel has from the U.S., will the U.S. continue that support? Will that capability remain? Will that appetite for this level of conflict continue in relation to what Israel ultimately wants? So those are two separate questions. As for the end game in Gaza, it was never clear. In the north, it's more clear, even though it does not justify a war, necessarily. In the north, it is about returning the inhabitants of, of the Galilee by, uh, by guaranteeing that Hezbollah will move backwards beyond the Litani River. If this will be achieved, Israel will be very happy about it. That's at least a clear end game. In Gaza, you don't have even this. And the, and the key is in Gaza because as Hezbollah was very clear about it. As long as Gaza continues, the North will continue to, to be a war zone. Now, as for the United States, I don't see the United States changing its policy for sure not uh, two months before elections or even less. This will not happen. The United States will continue to support Israel, to arm Israel, to, to finance Israel, at least until the elections. You saw the United States totally passive after the attacks on Beirut, on Lebanon. Uh, nothing, no condemnation, no call for restraint, the means, nothing. The United States is behind Israel and now more than ever. Would that continue as far as supporting the type of rhetoric uh, from Israeli politicians that southern Lebanon can be turned into a second Gaza? Because if that's the realistic scenario, would that be allowed to continue? The Americans might condemn it, but they as Gaza. In Gaza, you saw what is the American policy calling Israel, requesting Israel to stop the war, and arming Israel and financing Israel non-stop and in an unconditioned way. This, might, this will continue for sure also in Lebanon. The United States will be very concerned, will give all kinds of advices, even some threats to Israel, but it will continue to supply the weapons and the money and the ammunition. And by this, you get an hypocritical position in which Israel can continue freely. How does the Israeli government continue to navigate the issues it's facing internally, the pressure that it's facing from people within Israel? And this weekend, we're likely to see more protests across the country calling for an end to the war, calling for the return of hostages. How is that? How does that continue to be sidelined, given that these protests have gone on for so long? This protest is very impressive and it's going, it's going for so long, as you rightly say. And those protesters are very devoted, but they have zero influence on this government. And I say there is a lot of sorrow, obviously. They, this is not the political basis of this government. And as it's not the political base, they can easily ignore it. They did not cross the borders of of their political camp, and therefore it's very easy to ignore their protest and to go on with the policy. I would like just to correct you. They don't call to end the war. They call to release the hostages. They call for the resigning resignation of this government and Benjamin Netanyahu. They call, obviously, to get a ceasefire in order to release the hostages, but they are not very clear about ending the war and withdrawing from Gaza. I didn't hear this from them. And that's a major difference. 
All right, Gideon Levy, thank you very much uh, for speaking to us uh, and for your insights uh, on these developments uh, between uh, Lebanon and uh, Israel, Hezbollah uh, and Israel. Thank you very much. Now Make sure to subscribe to our channel to get the latest news from Algeria.